You're listening to Australia Overnight on 3AW693. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working uh, with uh, my next guest. Uh, I think he's one of the finest comedy minds uh, in the country, full stop. His name is Tony Martin. We had to recruit him from New Zealand. Their loss, our gain. He joins me now. Good morning, Tony. Good morning, Tony. I, I should say that I am often mistaken uh, for you. Like, people will often compliment me <laughs> on Twitter and they'll go, oh, you're so funny that Guido Hatz, this is the funniest <laughs> thing you ever did. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we do, look, we do look similar. Glasses, tall, dark hair, um, piercing blue eyes. And, We've um... both done our time at, um, at Triple M. I should let you listeners know that when... You used to come on Get This on yeah. our show at Triple M. I did with Ed Cavalier and Richard Barsland. You were the person who, off air and sometimes on here, always had the most scurrilous stories about management. Yes, true, true. Uh, they been... Are you accumulate? Are you getting any at that place? <laughs> Are you kidding me? It's chalk it's surely and not cheese. The exciting action in the in the management corridors at, at AW and. Affiliates, surely, in the AM world, there's there's nobody shelving garlic tablets by <laughs> mistake. God, you've got a good one memory. Story. I remember you telling us oh, on here. Yes, that is true. You've got a great. No, the only kind of drugs you'd see hoarded here are for osteoporosis <laughs> and <laughs> of that sort of thing. Lem sip. That's right. Uh, that's about as hard as it gets. No, uh, commercial radio uh, certainly lived up to its reputation, and I'll never, never forget the uh, white faces of panic when um, somebody. <laughs> I'm sure I told you this one. Somebody had organised um, the border authority or customs or which what whatever they were called back then, to come into the place with a sniffer dog, just to, because it was oh, sniffer, really? it was sniffer dog week or something. And right. there was a lot of people who had to abandon their desks and then suddenly make themselves absent uh, when that thing yeah. walked into the building. The sound of flushing toilets on every floor. <laughs> that's, that's right. So, oh, this, the stories, the, well, the stories I did tell and the stories I, I could tell, I guess. But yes, we, we now in a strange, um, there was no handover ceremony, but you were kind kind enough to leave behind a magnificent magnum of champagne. And that was when you guys, you and Mick, left Osterio, Jules and I literally ascended to the workman hut on the roof yes. of the building in St Kilda Road. That's right. We did have... People still ask me about that. And I think people felt that we must have demanded it. But it was because there was no room in the building, because... Triple M and Fox, uh, or Today FM, if, if people are listening up north, uh, combined, and then there was just there just wasn't enough room in the in the building for us. So we were threatening to move down the road to to MCA, and they went, "Oh no, no, we can't get them off site." Yeah. So they literally craned a workers' hut up onto the roof <laughs> of the building in St Kilda, and then people would come from all around to see. I remember Neil Mitchell from. From that station really? coming, just wandering up onto the roof to see if this uh, worker's hut was real. And, and it was. It had a magnificent view of the bay. And yeah. uh, like I said, when we moved in, you, um, uh, you'd you left behind that uh, that bottle of champagne. Uh, the other, I don't the, know how that happened. Well, I, it, uh, your loss, our gain, again. Um, what... what uh, the thing we were told at the time was um, having you kind of outside of the building also meant that you were immune from the knock on the door and somebody from sales leaning in saying, I've got a great idea for one of your little skits. Oh, there was a lot of that. But I think the main thing was the music because we were, oh, we were in, the show started at four and we were in there usually at 10 in the morning writing comedy sketches. And yeah. if you're in the building, there's just no way of escaping the relentless, uh, you know, classic rock triple play. <laughs> it's very hard to write a sketch when Brian Adams' Summer of 69 is being played for the fifth time that day. <laughs> that's, that's, so we were in this track. Often people from sales would come out and just stand. Can I just stand in your office because it's quiet? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> so I just it, stand there for five minutes. It was a safe harbour. That. How do you look back on that show now? Um, I'm, I'm Because it was... It was gigantic at the time. How do you, with the benefit of, of about two decades, how do you look back on it? Well, it's strange because I've been finding bits of it 
the uh, I donated all my recordings of the show to the uh, National Film and Sound oh, Archive. I remember that, yeah. Because they had uh, laid, Tony Abbott had laid off most of their staff, yeah. so it took them, uh, I think, something like eight years to digitise them all, and then they wow. sent me a copy of all of it. And so I've been going through some of it to find things to put on uh, my YouTube channel, and it's quite extraordinary to... To th- it was just so comedy-oriented, that's yeah. the thing about that show. It was mostly sketches and bizarre, you know, taking recordings of politicians and changing the questions to the answers they'd given. It was very production-heavy, and you don't really hear a lot of that. We had callers and we had guests, but, you know, probably two-thirds of the show was written comedy. Uh, how, and the other third was Mr. Methane. I got... <laughs> <laughs> Me, mate, yeah. who was the... Uh, do people know what Mr. Mate... I think people often think I'm making this up, but this was one of the world's most popular entertainers in the 90s, a man who... Well, how do you describe well, it on he, this he, station? He, uh, he, was able to, he was able to vocalise out of his backside. Can we put it that yeah, way? His, yeah. it's the phrase, he, he was from a place, I think, called Macclesfield, so we talk like this. <laughs> and and he, I said, how do you describe what you do? And he goes, it's controlled anal voicing. <laughs> And he would sort of lie on his back and, and with his legs in the air yeah. and inhale through the back door. There was this alarming sound. That's what people always say on the radio. It wasn't so much the farts, it was the intake, the sort of <laughs> sound. And then he would play music. Uh, uh, the the moment I think um, the the one that we remember is when Mick had forgotten to get get his mother something for her birthday, and he he rang her up, and she was a very proper, well spoken woman who called him Michael. That's right, and then Mr. Methane did happy birthday in flagrant uh, disregard of copyright laws. <laughs> but, uh, That's right; it still is. Yes. Um, but but he once I said, "What's the biggest audience you played?" And he said, "I once played <laughs> Shea Stadium before a baseball game, and and I played the the national anthem. <laughs> He's like done the Star Spangled Banner." Yeah, he uh, he did us all a favour that he wore. People forget he wore a disguise over his eyes. He wore like a, a an eye thing, like a superhero. Um, yes. Because um, you wouldn't recognise a six foot six skinny man with a very thick <laughs> Manchester accent. That's right. He was dressed as a superhero. Yeah. And one thing I was I was reminded of recently is this is like about 1996. He came on our show and he goes, "I'm thinking of doing an album." <laughs> and I went, "Okay." And he goes, "I need you guys. You're creative. I need you to think of a title." And I thought of the best title ever immediately because his name was Paul Oldfield. Oh. So what should the title be? It should be Tubular (laughs) Bow. Of course it should be. That's the only correct answer. And he went away for a year and he came back and he had the album. Here we go. I'm I'm nudging him. I'm going, he's used my title. And I go, what have you called it? And he goes, there's this new thing called the internet. So I've called the album www.mrmethane.com. Which he thought was hilarious to call it that. Oh, my God. Uh, of course, I mean, you'd be shut down for carbon emissions these days of contributing to climate change. So it's a, probably banned he, in most of Europe. Exactly. So he, he kind of peaked early. Um, I, in the, the reading, the reading that I was doing, there, there are some remarkable things in your history, which I think has made you, well, obviously who you are, Tone. Um, the, yes. the thing that I was really taken with, um, your dad can have a boring job. He can be an accountant, uh, I don't know, a fighter pilot, whatever. Yours was what, a semi-professional Marlin fisherman who had you living on a boat? Uh, uh, that was one of my stepdads because my mum was uh, married a number of times. Okay. And yet in the mid-70s, uh, my dad at that time, uh, yes, he, was a, he, he ran an, a home appliance store, a yeah. Fisher and Paykel dealership. But on the weekends, he had a 42-foot launch, which is quite wow. enormous. Yeah. And all of, our, all of his money went into it. And uh, we would go out, uh, yeah, marlin. He was determined to catch a marlin. So we would go up around the Bay of Islands in this boat. And oh, we would often God. live at sea. Like, 
we'd be living at sea for three or four months at a time, and I would be doing school on on the radio. You know, like the kid on Skippy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'd, be, okay. I'd be doing like correspondent radio. So I just spent an enormous amount of time at sea. And as I remember it, he never caught a single one. He had that chair, you know, the yeah. chair from Jaws that yeah. they sit in. And we're trawling for Marlin, and he just never caught one. And I, I remember one time he, we went into port, and someone had a giant shark hanging from a crane that they caught, like a 10-foot shark. And he paid the guy who caught the shark <laughs> uh, for us to be photographed with it so that he could tell everyone back in Thames where we uh, lived that he'd caught it. Uh, That's quite sad. Yeah. God. And I remember one time my mum had a go. Yeah. She jumped in the chair, and she caught an 8-foot hammerhead shark. <laughs> Furious, he like took over the rod. He's going, yeah, yeah I'll reel it in, Al. <laughs> he was so wow. furious that she wow. caught a bigger fish, that, like, like on her first go. Wow, he'll he'll be sadly missed. But on about on that, that was you. The the note, I think this is in your Wikipedia page of just all oh, right of just digesting the goons and all that kind of great radio. And yeah, so, well, anyone guess... who's my age from New Zealand will remember that, like in the seventies, the the radio was just full of. British comedy from the from the forties and the fifties and the sixties. So we got I'm sorry I'll read that again and yeah. take it from here and and the one I love was the Goon Show. So when you're at sea, when you're living at sea, there's no telly yeah. and uh, and at night time we would just listen to the radio and that's where I, I I presume I got my love of sound effects and what we call rather pretentiously call theatre of the mind. Yeah. And the Goon Show I mean, people remember the Goon Show, they remember the characters and the comedy of it, but what they forget is the sound, the actual use of sound effects. I don't think it had ever been done before, that level of creating mental pictures using just sound. I remember there was one episode where a guy took... 90 seconds to fall down a flight of stairs. <laughs> that's and we just thought that was the oh, funniest thing we'd ever heard. And I've still to this, even on Sizzletown, the podcast I do now, I just I try and have as much stuff like that in as, as I can, as much stuff just using sound effects. Yeah. Noises. Well, I do, I do remember, again, one of the things that when we were sharing the Osterio building of, was it Matt or you going home to get tin cans because you needed a, you needed a sound of one of the characters in the sketches literally walking on tin cans? Is <laughs> that's it, right. Have that's I, right. have, have I remembered that correctly? That. Well, yeah, that was it. Was before Matt. You were talking about Matt Dow, the yeah. great audio engineer I work with now. This was yeah. Vicky Ma. Oh, the... Vic! Oh my God! There's a name I haven't heard in a while. Yeah. Oh, absolutely brilliant <laughs> yeah. audio engineer. Uh, yep. Very good at comedy. And yeah, we would. This was the. There were computers in the nineties, but there weren't as many tracks, and you would have to mix the sketches down in real time onto real to real tape. And I remember one time we had a sketch that we were. It was a it was a three and a half minute sketch, and we were playing the first song of the show was a four minute song. So we were racing to mix the sketch down before oh. the song ended, where it, when it had to be played, and there were still some sounds that weren't included. So I remember we would lay down boards on the the floor of the studio and do the footsteps, the walking <laughs> footsteps live as the sketch was going out. We would do stuff. <laughs> so that's, when you say, what do you remember about Martin Lloyd? That's the kind of stuff that leaps back into my head, the, just the elaborate soundscapes and but the, stuff so like that. That's what we would talk about, well, Jules and I would talk about, because that, that amount of, um, I don't want to say fanaticism, but dedication, that sort of, uh, you know, and against a deadline, um, <clears throat> because... Uh, you would probably know both he and I were just uh, absolute massive uh, borderline obsessed with with the Late Show, um, oh, yeah. <laughs> which which I'm going to get you to talk about now because again that was um, I'm still amazed by that show that the the well the ABC as constituted today I don't think would throw the set of keys to uh, such a ragged bunch and say just give us what is it twelve shows a year just make sure they're playable mm-hmm. on Saturday night how did how did that was- 20 shows a year, and it was was live to air, which was quite, I mean, it's still shocking to me to think that we did that every week live. Like, a lot of the shows pre-recorded all of the, you know, the stuntman segment and the street interviews, but probably it was a one-hour show that usually went 10 minutes over, and probably at least 35 minutes of it would have been live to air, and quite shambolic in parts. 
brilliantly but, shambolic. It, re- it was, a, to me, and I can tell you to a whole generation of other people, it was like a papal encyclical. It was delivered from the Vatican, <laughs> and it was to be, it was, it was not to be missed. Well, we had done that show, we'd done a radio show with that particular team of people for five years. So we always, we felt like we hit the ground running. And we'd also done five pilots for The Late Show Ah, at Channel 9 in 1990 before Kerry Packer showed us the door. And then we got the show up at the ABC two years later and we did a further two pilots. So in effect, there were seven pilots for The Late Show. I think that has to be a record. Yeah. And the people who lived in Melbourne had obviously heard the radio show for five years, but the rest of the country, we were like a new team. So I think of the people in the show, only Rob and Santo had been in the D generation. Yeah. Me and Tom had been in it, but we'd only had small roles. No one in the rest of the country had seen Mick Malloy and Jason Stevens and Jane Kennedy before. Yeah. And then Judith Lucy joined the next year. But it was, yeah, it was pretty... We just loved trying to do as many different styles of comedy in one show because even though it was live, we, we did... You could do a really... Uh, sort of messy live sketch, like a Graham Kennedy style Roman, you know, epic sketch. Yeah. Or, but then or you could, could go or, on to, you could throw to tape and go to really nicely acted sketches on film, like fake documentaries. Yeah. And then we would play ourselves, because people often compare it to Saturday Night Live, and I go, but Saturday, Saturday Night Live is just a sketch show. Like, we would play funny. ourselves doing street interviews, and yeah. I would review movies and Jane and Tom would show clips from Countdown and my favourite thing in the show was Mick Malloy and Santo Cholero did a thing called Commercial Crime Stoppers which yeah. is where they would take late night ads and review them like it was the movie show <laughs> So we just had so many different styles in one show. And I I can't think of a show before or since that's done that, that's had so many different, like they had the sketches that you would see on Fast Forward. It had the street interviews that you would see on Andrew Denton. It would have the overdubbed, you know, the things we did like bar jars. We just put put as many, just threw as much stuff at the wall. And of course, because it was live, it often died in the arse. I think there's two episodes of The Late Show where literally no one laughs at anything. What? Uh, You can't... Because in the early days, I think people didn't know what it was. Like, they'd just be bussed in, and they would go, oh, Ah. we thought we were going to see the Doug Anthony (laughs) All-Star. And so you can't add fake laughs when it's live to air. And you can't cut something out that that didn't work. It's it's there. Everyone's seen it. Um, from a production point of view, I rem- I remember hearing that you were you, you had your own. Let's say it wasn't a writing office as such. It was a house where you where you were all basically decamped for the week. But then oh, we <coughs> spent we spent a four, we spent a huge amount of our own. I think this is another thing no one's ever done because we we had done the pilots at nine and we had filmed a lot of stuff ourselves and we loved doing that. It was like oh hang on this is interesting. Interesting. going out with just a small video camera, which no one did in those days, and filming, you know, street interviews. And we noticed, oh, if you do it, if you do this, people don't think it's a real show. Like yeah. if you've just got a little home video camera, so people would be much more open. They, they, they would think we were students, just someone from RMIT. And so we love making our own stuff. And we also wanted to shoot stuff on film. Uh, and the ABC weren't going to let us do that. So we just saved all this money that we'd made from doing the Triple M breakfast show and invested it in the show. I think Michael Hirsch told me, I think, that we'd spent $400,000 of our own money on that show because we just wanted to make stuff ourselves and edit it and... You know, like, I don't, I don't know if you remember the Warren Perso film that I did, the, yeah. the one about the, the fictional film producer. That cost yeah. 10 grand to shoot oh that. Oh, my God. But, you know, we got to shoot it ourselves on film, which, and, and we got to edit it, and we did the, you know, we did the graphics and the sound and everything ourselves. And, yeah, of the one hour, usually about 20 to 25 minutes of it was stuff that we produced ourselves. Was and it, there, there was the stuntman... Um, one where two yeah, buses, all that two, two buses were literally rammed into each other. Yeah. And, uh, well, the idea with that was because we sh- we would shoot that on home video with no lighting or anything. Yeah. And we could shoot one of those in two two hours, like an eight minute. It was called Shit Scared. I'm not sure if I can say that, but that was the name of the segment. Yeah. And it it was. 
we could shoot one of those in two hours. And if you did it with a, a big crew, it would take a couple of days. And we didn't have a couple of days because we had to be writing the show as well. We, yeah. didn't have, we didn't have any writers. We were, it was just the seven of us. And what we discovered with, with that segment was if you shoot it on crappy home video, if there's a really big stunt, like two buses driving into each other, yeah. it has so much more impact because yeah. you're not expecting it on, on that lower budget sort of look. Yep. And I remember one time we, we shot a shit skit on film and it wasn't as good because it was when you have it on nice looking film, you expect a big stunt. Yep. You weren't expecting a stunt when it looked really cheap and crappy, so that yeah. was a big lesson. Well, I was what I was amazed about with that show was the amount of production that went into it and the turnaround time. Because as you said, it was live. You can bank certain amount of pre-recorded things, but other stuff you can't. You, um, as you say, you're writing them to be performed live. So, was there a day off during the week for you, or was it just? Well, no, we were we were stockpiling stuff for three months before ah, the show went to air because okay. you because they gave us the, the show that had been on before us that was live was the big gig yeah and that was a show that was a one hour show but probably only three to four minutes of it were pre-recorded there was gene kitson's newsreader and there was the empty pockets but the rest of it was live and we went well we don't want to do that we want to have films and we want to have fake ads and shoot them really beautifully like real ads on yeah. film and and you you can't do that in the week of... Ter so I think we had one filming day with the ABC crew on Thursday, and you could literally only get four minutes of screen time out of that. So we would have to start months in advance. That stuff, the olden days in bar jars, that took so long. I mean, we that was me, Santo, and uh, Mick locked in a, in a room from 9 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock at night oh, once a God. week. And we, I remember one time we got nine seconds of footage because <laughs> that was like doing animate. You know, that was yeah. that thing where you had to dub the vo And we didn't have the ability to put it into a computer and, and do it the way you would do it. Now we're sitting there with VHS tape I... going, hang on, I think there was a bit in episode 37 of Bluey where he turns round and then you'd have to shuffle through the fast forward. Yeah, there, oh, no, he's wearing a different coat. We can't use that one. It was oh so God. painstaking to to do it. So yeah, there was a huge lead up to the to the actual filming. There was, however, a distinct lack of, and this amazed me in the research that I'd done, Tony Martin. <laughs> yes, there was a lack of puppets, given your experience as a puppeteer. Oh, I did have a brief period as a puppeteer, despite having no skill in the area. I worked on rubbery figures. That was before I worked with the Degeneration, and it, I, I don't know if people would remember Rubbery Figures. Oh, it was sort yeah, of like Spitting Image, you yeah. know, the English show, but it was made on a much lower budget by Peter Nicholson, the age cartoonist, who yep. was also a brilliant sculptor, and he made all these puppets and did a five-minute show. Four Corners would be on for 55 minutes, and then instead of Media Watch, they would have this five-minute puppet show, satirical puppet show, and he made it all at his house with a crew of, like, five people. People and I got a job on that show, and you did everything. I was a sound effects editor. I did some of the voices. I wrote some of the very few of them, but a couple of scripts. And uh, and me and Marianne Fay, who ah. was um, Kylie Mole, of course. Yeah, uh, we were the two puppeteers for <laughs> for uh, the rubbery figures. That's um... so I spent a lot of time with my hand up, Paul Keating's backside. <laughs> This is 1986. Wow, wow. You, you were like the press gallery then. Oh, <laughs> exactly. oh um, one thing I, I, I wanted to talk to you about, because I had the pleasure of reading your book, and I know I've bored you with this before, Lolly Scramble um, oh, is, yeah. is just one of the most delightful books you'll ever read. And if you can track down, it's Tony's first book, I believe. It's called yeah, it's Lolly Scramble. 2004. Um, or five, 2005. And, yep. and, um, and uh, your, your abilities translate just as easily to the written page. There's um, two things things I wanted to get out of that. Your brilliant um, method of extortion from your mother with the with the phrase, I need it for school, which, oh, yes, which was just a right. shakedown scam. But also that you, you, you read the most, you wrote the most beautiful uh, tribute to passbook banking. 
Well, I still have a, a there, banking see, passport. And that is exactly what I wanted to talk to you about because I'm going to tack on a question then about eccentrism. Um, but yes. you, how how do you fight against that tide? How uh, you, yours must be the only one left in Australia. Your bank box. No, it's there's a lot of they don't issue new accounts, but they keep servicing the existing ones. So they're just waiting till we die off. I'm sure there's a lot of older people listening to this who still have passbooks because when we go to the bank, there's there's still a queue of people with them in their hand and it's like I like to think that we're keeping the staff in work you know if you go in there <laughs> yep. there's, there's often you'll see you know are you sure you you don't want to go online and I'm going you're advocating for your own redundancy you yeah. do realize that don't you and I, I find that a lot of them quite enjoy having to you know use the old skills they have to you know get out the passbook and, and, and then if you, you know, when you get a new one, they have to stamp every page of the previous <laughs> one cancelled. Oh, yes. And then they have to get you to write your sample signature on that little piece of paper that goes under the black light. Oh. And then when you've written your signature on that little piece of paper, they very flamboyantly screw it up <laughs> so you can see that they're throwing it in the bin. They love doing all that theatre. Yep. The theatre of the passbook. And then they feed it into the chattering machine. Oh, I was and wondering if they still had that, which prints on it. Some Sometimes it'll, they'll go, oh, it's, it's printed over itself. I'll have to write it in by hand. You know, there's just all this passport etiquette, that, yeah. uh, sorry, passbook etiquette that, that still goes on. And, uh, yeah, no, it's still, they're still there. But, but in a shrinking number of available branches, I would have thought. No, it's in every, it's in every, like, okay. I go into most branches and they, I did go into one in Turak and there was, there was like a, a look of disgust. They said, do we have one of these machines? And someone had to bring it out. <laughs> right. Um, that was great. I went into, into a bank in Turak and, uh, I, and they said, how do you want the, 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 the money? And I said, um, can I have it in 50s? And they went, really? <laughs> what? Like, we don't have 50s here. We only have 100. Oh, of course, it is Turak, of, um, darling. Yeah. Now, what and, a, what uh, a, what a, Really? 50s? 50, How yeah. gauche. Uh, no, uh, I'm surprised there wasn't somebody who said, you ain't from around here, are you, boy? Yes. <laughs> That's right. Now, now the, um, the shakedown scam you had going with, with your mother produced one of the great lists um, that I've ever read in terms of comedy, the other being the amount... <laughs> The amount of things retrieved from the stage that had been thrown on while Iggy Pop was performing once, and they involved Tony twenty eight dollars in loose change, a bowling ball, and a dead dog. All right. <laughs> That's when you know it's been a good show for Iggy. <laughs> exactly. But your list of you were able to say to your mum, "I need it for school," and uh, th this is also in uh, in Lolly Scramble. Do you remember that particular story? I I, I don't remember the list, but it is. I remember oh. it's you know magnified fine glass and, yep. uh, you know, a, a yep. Super 8 yep. camera. And, 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 and uh, yeah. tickets to the opening of the Hamilton Film Festival. <laughs> right. I did claim that I needed tickets <laughs> to the film festival because I was going to be reviewing them for English. It was ridiculous. Uh, see, it's a, it's a good scam if you can pull it off. But it did. I, I did want to um, bring up the... Because the passbook is, is eccentric, there are things about you, and, and, and this is meant as complimentary as possible, um, that are slightly eccentric. And I'm wondering if if eccentrism in New Zealand is more um, kind of valued or nourished than it is in Australia, because it certainly is in England. I think it's a beautiful thing. I think it's a great thing and a, a sign of great creativity. But I, I just don't see any tradition of Australian eccentrism. Well, I, it's hard for me to say because I moved here in 85, so all of my ideas about New Zealand are like 40 years out of date. Mm. Mm. But it is, it was certainly much more English. That's what I remember. Right. That, that's what you, I remember noticing first when I moved from, from New Zealand to Australia. Like in England, uh, sorry, New Zealand, in the, even back in the 70s, the news, the, the, a show would finish on TV and a man in a tuxedo with an English accent would come on and go, that was softly, softly <laughs> task force. Next stop, it's the O'Needham line. And it was quite English. And then you come over here and the news on, was like an American news desk with like two people on the news desk. And it was yeah. like, oh, it's much more sort of American. But I don't know. It's sort of, it's, it, it's sort of hard to describe the, the, the New Zealand sensibility. I, I remember trying to describe to someone the difference between Paul Hogan and John Clark. I went, yeah. that's a pretty good illustration of the difference between Australia and New Zealand. What a great way of putting it. Because Paul Hogan is very low-key. Yeah. He's not... 
he's not big and hammy, but he's quite different from John Clark. Uh, yeah, who's you know cerebral and um, uh, wry, very understated. Uh, yeah, it's very low key, like New Zealand. Um, I remember someone telling me a, a New Zealand joke. It's not a very funny joke, but it's a joke that that sums up a New Zealand sensibility, and that's two people are, are born in the, the same hospital and two babies, and they're in the next you know incubator or whatever from each other, and then they, they leave the hospital and they live their lives, and 70 or 80 years pass, and then they find themselves back in the same hospital as old men next to each other in the two beds next to each other, and one just looks over at the other and goes... So what did you make of all that? <laughs> that I really like that. that. Is like the New Zealand sense of humour for me. Well, it um, it reminds me of one of my my kind of favourite uh, opening lines to a lecture, if you want, of a, uh, a dissident professor in South America who was arrested uh, halfway through a lecture. <laughs> And then he was taken away five years, soles of his feet beaten, the whole rest of uh, the rest of it, uh, regime change, and he gets his job back. And he begins his lecture with the words, "As I was saying," which, which, I, which I think is lovely. So, did you work with John Clark at all? Did your paths cross, Tony I Martin? Did. I was very lucky to, to have a bit to do with him because I, you know, grew up in the seventies, and it's really quite hard to explain to an Australian how big. John Clark was in New Zealand. Yeah. He was so popular. He was like beyond Elvis levels of popular. His first album, the th- which was called Fred Dagg's Greatest Hits, that was his first album. Yeah. I think was is still possibly the biggest selling album in wow. all time in New Zealand. And it was every house had it. And it, he was so um it was impossible for him to even go down to the shop. So he did this crazy thing in 1977. He just moved to Australia at the very height of his popularity. He had, a, he had an album at the top of the charts. He had a movie out and he had a TV series. And he just moved to Australia and started all over again. And I, yeah, I met, he, was, he did a cameo in The, the Degeneration when we were in, at Channel 7. I remember that was the first time I met him. And then... My ex-wife, Annie Maver, who yeah, I think you would know, I do. Yeah. she worked on almost all of his TV production. She was his first assistant director on the games and yep. on the Murray Whelan films that he did. So I would just use any excuse to go into the set of those things just to hang out with him. And I got to the, the best thing I got to do was we were both in the film Cracker Jack. And yeah. We're in a scene together, but it actually took a whole week to film that scene, the big finale of the movie. So I just spent a whole week on the on the set of a, at a bowls club in Cora with John Clark, just listening to him speak because he was just such an entertaining speaker. Uh, remarkable by all accounts. I, I, uh, I never had the pleasure, I've got to say, and it's something uh, I definitely regret. Now, Tone, we hear you on Sizzletown now. We mentioned Matt, Matty Dow, an enormously talented man. Um, yes. How, how do Probably we feel... the best audio engineer for comedy in oh, Australia, yeah, I would suggest. Yeah. He's, he's, he's amazing. Um, how, do we, how do we access what you're doing now, which is Sizzletown? And uh, uh, and I want to know because you are a movie. I think the last time I bumped into you was at a cinema in um, yes. in uh, not far from where I live. And um, I want to know if you're seeing anything in the British Film Festival. It's a question no, without I, notice. I haven't uh, seen. What is there anything you can recommend? Uh, Lancaster. It's a documentary on the Lancaster bomber. Oh, so, of course, <laughs> you'd be recommending that one. You and so. Michael Veach yes. will be off to see that. That's right. A double date. But, um, uh, but Sizzle Town is a, a podcast which. You you can uh, find uh, on Apple iTunes or whatever. <laughs> Is it still called iTunes? Is that oh, like the passbook? It's yeah. uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever yeah. podcasts are, are found. It's a fake talkback show where I play the host and all of the callers, so it's quite an elaborate thing to make. Now, um, and we can also see your star turns on uh, Have You Been Paying Attention? And I wonder if you, I'm going to set you up here and see if you can... Uh, this is just... Some of your finest work, oh. um, I think uh, you may even agree that one of your finest jokes of all time is the Norgan Vars one. Am I, am I right I in saying that? I remember what that is. Are you kidding me? That's one of the greatest jokes ever. You, oh, you were talking... Have, paying attention. You, no, no, not on uh, Are You Paying Attention, but years ago you were talking about the United Nations when they were peacekeeping and you were talking about their uniforms. which oh, they had blue tanks blue and white t- uniforms. That's right. I, I think I was talking about it would be good if they were fighting a war in a Norgan Vars <laughs> 
I, I don't know what, why we've brought that up. <laughs> that is just one of the great lines of all time. But on uh, recently, on uh, 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 I love this. You said this on. Uh, uh, have you been paying attention? There was an election recently in Switzerland to decide what. Do you remember what you said? No, I really don't. Oh, tone the next five blades on a Swiss Army knife. Oh, oh, okay. Great work. It's an absolute. It's a, it's an absolute roller coaster ride that show, and you you're just flailing for anything. Oh, that, come on. And you often don't remember what you've said till you see it the next night. All right, well, then... And they do do a bit of editing on that show, so you don't see all of the terrible clangers. I always drive home going, why did I say that? Oh. No, well, that's a, the, the the value of editing and and uh, and the annoying thing is comedy nerds like me remember it and repeat it back to you. Tony, a delight as always to speak to you. Thank you so much for your Thanks, time this Tony. morning. Great to talk to you too. Love your work. And and if you pointed out, I didn't realise. Re- maybe people don't know this about you. You were the winner. You and several other people were the winner of the uh, Actors' Equity. Ensemble Award. We did, yes. Which was for the librarians, because I got to work with you in, yes. in as a director in the uh, librarians TV show. That's right, and that award was presented to me by the postman on my doorstep. So I I gave him a ninety second acceptance speech, and then music started up out of nowhere. <laughs> I'd, I'd forgotten about that award, and somebody pointed out to me because I I forgot that all the people in the band in the yeah. Oils Aid Oils band were included in that. You and Justin Hamilton, and so yeah, you you've won an Actors Equity Award. <laughs> Thank That's, you. You've won one of the top acting awards in the country, Tony. Thank you very much. I put it down to your great direction, Tony. Got to got to wrap you up there. Very nice note upon yes. which to end, and we'll speak soon. I hope. All right, thanks, Tony. Good on you. The great. Man. The day after the. Bar-